My Hebrew isn't that good. It's been a long time since my bar mitzvah. But there's one word that I keep hearing over and over, and I know what it means, and that's data. As I live my life around data. Many of you are too. Uh, but here's the difference. Are you struggling with the data? How do we take all this data and do something with it? Or are you letting the data guide the decisions that you make? And that's what I want to talk about. Too many companies are thinking about, okay, we have a strategy. We know what we're doing. We know what we want to achieve. How are we going to use the data to help us achieve that strategy? I think that's the wrong question. Because the problem is the way that companies have been operating for a long time uh, is that they've been very product-centric. Let's come up with an idea. Let's produce it in great quantities. Let's, uh, let's get our costs down. Okay, let's, let's think of, of everything we're doing uh, around the product or the service that we're offering. And let's use the data to help us do that better. I want to think about a, a completely different approach, which is how do we build a new strategy around the data? Instead of trying to use all of this great new data that we have to try to fit it into existing old strategies, strategies that were developed in an era when the data wasn't available. I think about a, a lot of the way we do business today is the same way that Henry Ford uh, uh, started doing business 100 years ago. We come up with an idea, we produce a lot of it, we get our costs down. We don't really care if we're selling 10 million cars to the same person or one car to 10 million different people because it's all about production. But now that we have the accurate data that we have, maybe we could think about a very different way of doing business. So I have a, a, a new book called A Customer Centricity, the idea of building strategies from the customer up instead of from the product down. If you're interested, you can uh, get a copy on Amazon, cheap paperback, download it. <laughs> Uh, but I, I really don't want to, I want to talk only a little bit about the book today. I want to talk about more of the, the why it matters. So the idea is that the traditional product-centric way of doing business doesn't work quite as well as it used to be. Thanks to technology, everything is becoming a commodity. Our customers are becoming much smarter and more demanding. Issues like deregulation, globalization, just sitting back and producing something producing a lot of it and hoping you're going to make a lot of money doesn't work quite as well as it used to. I'm not saying that the product-centric model is completely gone and that you'll fail if you use it. I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying that there's another way of doing business, and that would be more customer-centric. Again, starting with the data and building a strategy off of it. So I want to talk only very briefly about this idea of customer centricity. A lot of companies are talking about it. A lot of companies don't know what they're talking about. They think about it as just fancy words that let them do the same thing that they were doing before, but in a more customer-friendly manner. So there are many companies out there in the US and Israel and elsewhere that experts say these are customer-centric companies, and I disagree. So I have my own definition of what customer centricity means. Uh, I just want to spend just a, a minute talking about it, because I want to talk more about the why it matters. Because I think many of you believe me already. Many of you believe me that that's why you're here, is because you want data to, to drive your strategies instead of the other way around. So I really believe in what you see over here. For instance, look at the bottom line. Okay, All firms, when they're talking to their investors, say, we believe in long-term value. We believe in maximizing profits over the long term. They say that to the investors, and they turn around to the employees and say, look, we have the quarterly numbers to make. OK, enough of this long-term talk. Let's get on. If you use the data and you understand who the valuable customers are and who the valuable customers can be and what you can do to make those customers even more valuable, that really, really, really lets you think in the long term instead. So I think that this idea of customer centricity lets you really, truly operate and talk about the long term. But a big part of it is the need to, to choose a select set of customers. Instead of treating everybody the same, we now have the capability to understand why they're different, to understand how we can serve them differently. To, and here's the hard part, to understand which ones are really valuable to us, and we should treat them a little better than we treat the ones who aren't as valuable to us. That is critical. 
There are many companies that don't believe in that, and that's because they're incapable of doing it. They're not using the data well enough to sort out the good customers from the bad ones. They don't have the strength to be able to treat them differently. But with the right kind of data, and more importantly, with the right kind of insights that you draw from the data, you now have that capability. And firms are starting to do that very successfully, and that's what requires the big change in strategy. It's also what, what requires a big change in the organization. To really do this stuff right, to truly be customer-centric, you have to learn from an industry that I'm sure some of you would, would admit that you're from, but not enough of you. And that's the idea of direct marketing. The direct marketers don't get nearly the attention of, of, of retailers or financial service firms or telecommunications, but they're the ones who were the first firms to put customer centricity on the map. They're the first ones to say, let's think about individual customers. Let's think about the value of each one. Let's think about the unique messages and products and services that we can serve up to some customers, but not others. So they're the ones who first gave us these ideas and came up with a lot of the first models to be able to predict who will be the most valuable customer and came up with the right metrics to let us understand how well we're doing at serving customers differently. So a lot of companies don't want to think about direct marketing. A lot of companies hear direct marketing and they think about late night TV commercials and cheap products that break the first time you use them. And that might be true. <laughs> But it's what's going on under the surface of direct marketing, the idea of identifying customers, knowing which one to treat how, knowing when to serve that message. Again, it's so easy today. It was difficult 40 or 50 years ago to do those kinds of things. But with a lot of the services that Google and, and other firms offer, it becomes so much easier. So why not build our strategies around it instead of taking those data and capabilities and, and fitting them into existing old strategies? Uh, so, uh, so the question is, if you do all this, how do you make money on it? And that's what I want to focus on today. So let me very quickly review the, the points of customer centricity. Right now I've just tried to motivate it for you. One more slide with some points about it, and then I want to talk about how you can actually make money on it, and some of the surprises that might emerge along the way. So in the customer-centric world, one thing I want to emphasize is that our goal, just like it is in the product-centric world, is to make as much money as possible. The ultimate objective is the same. There are too many companies that say, oh, I don't want to do that customer-centric stuff because I'm serious about my business. I want to make money. Customer-centric businesses are just as serious. It's just a very different strategy that helps you get there. And the key to the strategy in the customer-centric business is to, uh, is to not only recognize that, diff that customers differ from each other, not only to recognize that some customers are more valuable than others, but to celebrate it. Instead of saying, this is a nuisance. Oh, we have to look at customers differently. Now that we have all this data, we, we can't just treat everyone the same. Oh, that's hard. I say that's great. I say it's terrific that we can finally see who's valuable and who's not as valuable. Who's going to be more responsive to a particular offering and who's going to ignore it. I think that's great. Yes, it is difficult. Yes, it requires a different set of skills than we used to run a business 15 or 20 years ago, but it's a great source of meaningful, lasting competitive advantage. So again, I, I never, you'll never hear me say the words, the customer. Never say those words, because there is no the customer. There's a great variety of customers, and appreciating that and celebrating that, understanding how they're different, not just in terms of skin color, not just in terms of things they've done in the past, but in terms of value, the economic value that they bring to the company. So, so one thing is, is to understand how they differ from each other. So in the old days, we, we all uh, pray to the normal distribution. We would say, oh, there's some valuable ones, some less valuable ones, and a bunch in the middle. But now that we have data about customers, we know that this isn't true. It is never true. In other words, when I look at the value of each and every customer, and draw them out on a graph, what does it look like instead? Never looks like this, always looks like this. Many of you know about what in English we call the 80-20 rule. You all believe in the 80-20 rule, right? You know that. 
If you believe in the 80-20 rule, then you also believe in this distribution. Okay, it's a very important distinction that there are some customers out there who are incredibly valuable, and you really do want to run the business around them and hope that in serving those customers well, the other 80% will come along for the ride too. They'll say, you know what, these products are good too. Maybe I'm not getting treated as well, but it's a good deal for me anyway. Okay? So first of all, it's recognizing the nature of customer heterogeneity. Another part of it is to recognize that when, when we're talking about customer profitability, I'm not talking about the past. I'm not talking about the money that we already got from the customers. I'm talking about the money that we expect to make from them in the future. Okay, again, when you are valuing an organization, your, your, the, the stock price for your company doesn't reflect its past profits, it reflects your future profits. Same thing with your customers. So we're going to use all that past data, but not so much to say, here is the valuable customer. But we're going to use that past data to say, I have some understanding of this customer's needs and wants, my ability to serve them, and I'm going to turn that into a future statement about how valuable that customer will be in the future. Okay, it, they're related. Customers who are more profitable in the past tend to be more profitable in the future, but it's not a perfect mirror. All right, so it's being able to use the data to be able to make those kinds of projections. Uh, and the nice thing is that once you have all that data, once you truly understand what a customer has done, their true underlying propensities, their responsiveness to different kinds of messages, the kind of relationship expertise that you can develop, no one can ever take away from you. Earlier I talked about commoditization. I talked about how technology is making things more difficult for product-oriented firms. But when it comes to you and your customer, if you have the right kind of data and if you can anticipate what they're going to do and how it will change under different kinds of conditions, no one can ever take that away from you. All the technology in the world, you still own that relationship. So I, I find it to be a much better way, a much more defensible way to create competitive advantage than just trying to build a better product faster. Because you know that someone's going to build a, a, a better product the day after that. Very different way of doing business. It has uh, very big uh, implications for the way you, you define your organization. I don't want to spend too much time on this example. But we see when a big company like Procter & Gamble starts to take all of its different brands and aligns them around a particular kind of customer, that's what I'm talking about over here. I want to see more of this. I want to see more companies organized around customers instead of being organized around products. Now, Procter & Gamble hasn't gotten there yet. But to their credit, they're starting to test it. I think more companies should be testing it as well. So, so the big question, how are we going to make money on this? Let's talk about that. So if you do all this customer-centric stuff, and I'm not saying that all of you should, because there are many firms for a variety of reasons, some cultural, some availability of the data, some regulatory limitations, aren't going to become customer-centric and shouldn't. But for firms that can do it, they should be trying to find out what it's worth. And the question is, how do you make money on it? All of a sudden you say, we're customer-centric. It's expensive, it's risky, it's a very different way of doing business. What's the upside? How can you possibly make more money being customer-centric <clears throat> than being product-centric? And the answers lie in these three words over here. Acquisition, retention, development. <clears throat> Those words are not new. The idea of acquiring customers has been around forever. The idea of, of keeping the right customers is certainly not a new concept. And the idea of taking existing customers and making them even more valuable is something that all companies think about. My point, though, is to take these concepts, to take these activities, and raise them to a higher level in the organization. If you think about the way the marketing organization is run, who are the highest people within the marketing organization? It's the people who build the brand. It's the people who come up with the ad campaigns. And that's important. Don't get me wrong. Many of you do that. But I think that these activities over here that are usually assigned to lower level analytics people deserve to be at that very same level. It's not enough just to craft a nice message and to know how to position a product. I say, in the customer-centric world, it is just as important, maybe more important, to understand which kinds of customers to acquire, which customers are worth retaining, and which ones you have some chance at making them more valuable. I want to spend the rest of our time talking about some insights and surprises about each of these three activities. I actually want to ask you a question right now as we start to talk about 
uh, customer acquisition, what metric do you use to gauge how well you're doing at customer acquisition? What is the metric that, that every firm, especially digital-oriented firms, use to, to say how well they're doing at customer acquisition? What metric is that? Let me hear it. But how do we know how well we're doing at acquisition? Three letters in English. CPA. CPA. I heard CPA. CPA stands for? Cost per acquisition. Okay, you all know that one, right? I think it's a terrible, terrible idea. I think managing a business in terms of cost per acquisition is a recipe for, for failure. Okay? Think about other kinds of acquisition activities that you do. Think about when you acquire employees or new technology or, let's say, lawyers, just as examples. If you take a CPA mentality, the CPA mentality says, let's spend as little as possible. Let's use technology to drive our costs down as low as possible to acquire a customer. I think that's a bad idea. You wouldn't do it for these kinds of things. Why do it for your customers? So what should you be doing instead of CPA? Instead of finding customers from the cheapest manner, what should you be doing? What's the V stand for? Value, right? Value per acquisition, customer lifetime value. Instead of figuring out how little we can spend to acquire customers, see that mindset goes back to Henry Ford. Let's just bring customers in. We don't know who they are. We don't care who they are. Let's just bring in as many of them as we can. And then they'll just buy our stuff. That's the wrong way of thinking about it. Today we have the capability, and in some cases the requirement from senior management, to find the most valuable customers instead. And here's a great example for you. So here's a, a paper. It's an academic paper, but it's a really nice example. Just, you can look at the title alone. So what's the value of customers that we've acquired through Google-sponsored search? Instead of asking the question, how little did we spend through Google-sponsored search to acquire those customers, what are they worth? What's their future value? And you look at some of the analyses that go on here, and, and, I, and I won't say more than this about this kind of paper. So, in, so yes, we can acquire people for you know, two or three dollars through sponsored search. That's great. You know, yes, would it be better to bring those numbers down, all else being equal? Sure. But all else is not equal. And we find tremendous upside. We find that depending on how we acquire the customers, they're going to be worth, let's say, you know, 1000 versus $800. And when you look at the numbers this way, it makes you realize that spending 2 versus $3 on acquiring a customer is ridiculous. It's irrelevant. So when you're focusing on the future, when you're focusing on the long term, CPA is absolutely the wrong metric to be looking at. And it is great to see that you can actually directly link future value, lifetime value, to different kinds of acquisition activities. You know, granted, these are relatively new ideas. These are papers that are just getting published now. But it's a new way of approaching things. And you need to start asking that question differently. So that's the part about acquisition. Let's talk briefly about customer retention. So what's the metric that we use to see how well we're doing at customer retention? What will companies look at? They'll look at a churn rate, or an attrition rate, or a retention rate. Okay, how good are we at, at, at keeping the customers around who have been with us? Okay, you're familiar with that idea? And I want to show you that in the data-driven world, the way we look at the retention rate changes a lot. So there are some companies out there. Here's an, here's an example from Vodafone that shows their churn rate over time. And it looks pretty steady. Okay, it looks like their, their churn rate, their attrition rate, is around, let's say, you know, 18%. Every year, they're losing about 18% of the customers, holding on to just over 80% of them. OK? You, you, you're familiar with numbers like this? So the question is, how do we translate these retention rates into lifetime value? Let me ask you another question, a math question this time. Suppose your, your attrition rate is 20%. Okay, 20% of your customers leave every time. What's the expected lifetime for an average customer? So if we lose 20% per year, then how long does an average customer stay with us? Five years. 
right? One over 20%. In this case, it's just under 20%, so it'll be just over five years. Sounds right? Totally wrong. And if you guide your business that way, you're in trouble. Let me show you the right way to do it. See, the question is, oh, let me ask you another question. <clears throat> what is it that we celebrate? Heterogeneity. We acknowledge and we celebrate the fact that different customers have different propensities, which includes different attrition propensities. It is not the case that each and every customer is 20% likely to leave. Some are more likely than others. So staying with the Vodafone example, here is what that heterogeneity distribution looks like. And by the way, this is what it looks like for almost every company. It's that same kind of curve that we looked at before. So you have some folks who are very likely to leave early, some folks who are, well, we'd like to say loyal. They might just be inertial. They just don't make their decisions very often. They just stick with you because they don't want to bother thinking about it. But let's pretend they're loyal, whatever. They're less likely to leave. So if I give you this kind of data and ask you, how long would we expect a customer to stay? Well, let's look at the data. All right, so we see the size of each of those spikes, in other words, the percent of people associated with it, and the attrition rate associated with them. What you would be inclined to do, or I, I, I hope you won't, but what some of you would be inclined to do would be to take the average. Let's take a weighted average of these numbers over here, and then take one over that, and that would give us our overall expected lifetime. Make sense? So we could do that calculation take the weighted average, we come up with an attrition rate of about 18%, and we say, okay, we expect our customers to be around just over five years. What can be wrong about that? We're doing the average the wrong way. See, here's the problem. We took the average first, we came up with the average customer, and found that customer's lifetime. But there is no average customer. There is no single customer with an attrition rate of 18%. We need to do the analysis, the lifetime analysis, for each customer and then take the average. Now you're thinking to yourself, aren't I going to get the same answer? Well, let's see. So let's look at each of these customer groups and say, how long will they be with us? So for instance, if there's a group that has a, the medium risk of, of 35%, about how long will they be with us? About about three years, right? So we can do that for each of the different groups. But notice, for that group that has a very low attrition rate, 0.06, they're going to stay with us a long time, which is great. Those are our special customers, right? So now when we take the average, now we look at the lifetimes and now take the average, look what happens. Twelve and a half years. Same data different way of looking at it, all of a sudden our customer base is twice as valuable as it was before. Just like that. Just like that. I just doubled the value of your customer base without doing anything other than using the data properly. Okay, so I think there's a lesson right there, but it has important implications. Because now that we know, by doing it the right way, the customers are more likely to stay with us for a long time what does that tell us about the way we're going to spend money on acquisition, retention, and development? It means we can worry just a little bit less about customer retention. They're inclined to stay with us longer than we thought. And so where should we spend our money instead? Smart acquisition. Let's spend our money trying to find customers like those in the top group. Okay, because if we can find people like that, they're going to stay with us a very long time. So if we can look at our existing customer base and understand how are those low-risk people different than the high-risk ones? And again, I'm not talking about demographics. Maybe that too. But I'm talking about behavioral characteristics. How and when we acquired them. And let's go fishing in those waters for more customers. Right there. Without ever having a promotion. Without worrying about the brand. Again, those are important things. But just by managing this balance of retention and acquisition and using the data properly, celebrating heterogeneity and being forward-looking instead of obsessed with CPA, we can make the company incredibly more valuable. Now, I didn't talk that much about customer development. Let me do that for a moment. So you tell me once again, 
There are four ways of doing customer development. There are four ways to take your existing customers and make them more valuable. What are those ways? Ways such as cross-selling. Cross-selling is the big one. <clears throat> there is a single question that drives the entire American economy. Okay, America stays alive for this one question. Do you want fries with that? Okay, that's classic cross-selling. Okay, so, so we absolutely believe in cross-selling. Now, you have to try it, you have to do it, you have to constantly be asking that kind of question, but the upside to it isn't always as big as you think. The way I like to think about it, being someone who likes to eat a lot, is I think about cross-selling as icing on the cake. It takes an existing valuable customer base and makes them more valuable. But it's not cake. The cake is finding the right customers and keeping them around. Okay? Too many companies say, man, once we get them in the door, we're going to cross-sell them and make them really more valuable. Cross-selling is important. You have to do it but, it, it. but its value is much smaller. Anyway, what are the other, very quickly, the other uh, ways of doing customer development? Besides getting people to buy other kinds of items from you, you will also you'll upsell. So you're going to move them to higher margin items that you sell. You'll also, well, the, a bigger basket would be cross-selling, getting to buy more items. But in another way, not necessarily a bigger basket at a given point of time, but more frequent purchases. Get them to buy your stuff more often. And the fourth one is the one that no one wants to talk about. Okay? It's the most controversial one of all. But we have to acknowledge it. We have to acknowledge that if we have really good customers, and they like us not only because we, we produce very good products and services, but because we understand their needs and we hit them with the right messages at the right time, that we, we, they actually trust in us, then what's something we can and should consider doing? Raising the prices. For companies that you like, I'm sure you would admit to yourself, even if not to the company, that you'd pay a lot more for them. Right? Now, it's very tricky, and I'm not saying immediately jack up the prices on everybody, big mistake. But by using the data and drawing insight from it and celebrating heterogeneity, you actually can figure out who you can charge premium prices to and who would be perfectly happy because they're getting so much value from the relationship. Anyway, it's fourth of four on the list. I don't want to push it, but those are the four ways of doing customer development. So then there's the big question. How do we balance these things? If, if your senior manager gives you one more dollar to spend, where are you going to spend it? So I want to see a show of hands on this one. So you have one more dollar to spend in your marketing budget. Are you going to spend it on acquisition, retention, or development? Sorry, how many of you say acquisition? Raise them high, raise them high. How many say retention? How many say development? Wow. After everything I just told you about development. <laughs> now, customer development is important, but what was the metaphor that I used for it? It's icing on the cake, not cake. Right? Development activities, you have to do it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying to cut development spending. I don't want you to walk away thinking that. But there are limits to how much you can get on it. Okay? It's hard to get people to necessarily put more in the basket or to move the higher margin items. You have to try. But I believe, especially because of the CPA mentality, because companies are spending as little as possible to acquire new customers, I firmly believe and have lots of, of evidence to show that companies are way underspending on acquisition. They're spending too little. They're not necessarily finding and, and, and acquiring the right kinds of customers. When you start thinking about VPA, the ceiling, of how much total money this, this customer is going to be worth, not that you want to spend that much to acquire a customer, because then you're not making any money on them, but right now we're focusing on the floor. There's a lot of room in there to spend more on acquisition, and not only to get more customers, but to get, help me out here, better customers, right? By being more customer-centric, and saying we're going to build this business around the right kinds of customers, it's going to cost you more. 
at least acquisition will cost you more. But the upside to it, look back at those retention numbers. When you find the right people, they're going to stay with you a long, long time. The value of that collective customer base is going to be much higher. So here's the recipe. Okay, this last slide for you. And then if there's time, I'm very glad to take any questions that you might have. So first of all, this idea of lifetime value isn't something that you do one time. Let me ask you this question. How many of your companies, how many of you, at least think about recognize that, that it would be interesting and maybe important to do lifetime value. How many of you do think about do some kind of CLV something? Okay, Some hands, more hands than I would have seen if I asked that question three years ago, but not enough hands. Okay, Because, again, I'm not pushing you to be customer-centric. I am pushing you to make an informed decision about whether, how, and when to become customer-centric. And you can't make that decision unless you know the value of your customers. So you have an obligation to your shareholders to do this and then to decide whether you want to build your business around it. If you want to build your business around it, then you need to be doing this pretty regularly. You can't just do it one time and then do it five years later because these numbers are going to be changing all the time. You need to be doing it on, let's say, a quarterly basis. I know companies that are doing it on a daily basis. Okay? It's all automated. So that's one thing, is to figure out the value of your customers and then break them into groups. We all believe in segmentation. I do too, just as much. But I just believe, I believe in segmentation in a slightly different way than some of you. Because too often, you're segmenting your customers on easily observable characteristics, gender, income, things like that. I'm saying we should be focusing our, our uh, segmentation efforts more around behavior, okay? Which might mean, for instance, how and when we acquired you. What campaign did we first acquire you through? What was the first product or service that you bought from us? Okay, who referred you? Because that's going to be very informative to us. Because if we find out down the road that you're a very, really valuable customer and we want to find more people like you, a natural thing to do would be to go back to the original source of acquisition that brought you in in the first place. Anyway, segment your customers on a behavioral basis. Do all of that retention and development stuff. Do it, okay? Don't get the wrong idea from what I said before. Very, very important to roll out the red carpet for the right kinds of customers. Very, very important to ask that great question, uh, do you want fries with that? Other kinds of cross-selling and development activities. Very important to do all of that. Okay? That's just not the purpose of my talk today. I don't want to minimize those kinds of things. Always want to be experimenting. Okay, I, I don't need to tell you, but, but today's data, today's fast turnaround enables the kind of experimentation that we couldn't have even dreamed of previously to find out which messages work well for the right kind of person. That's a must. You must build a culture around experimentation. To me, it's all about bottom up. Instead of saying, what's the next blockbuster product? And, oh, by the way, who will buy it? That's the wrong way to look at it. The right way is to say, who are our really valuable customers? And what kind of product or service can we develop for them that's going to make them even more valuable? And oh, by the way, other people will buy it too. Okay, so this idea of bottom-up, customer-centric perspectives to drive even R&D decisions that we might be making. Uh, we, uh, when it comes down to uh, emphasizing acquisition, we want to figure out which of those segments are the most valuable. Again, in terms of future value, not just in terms of the money we've pulled out of them already, but which segments have the highest future customer lifetime value, let's find more people like them. Let's figure out who those role models are, okay? And then constantly updating that. If you're going to be doing this customer-centric thing, you need to be doing it very, very frequently, very, very regularly. You don't do it only when there's a problem. You don't do it only when uh, you're about to launch a new product, you do it periodically. Every quarter, it's time to do a CLV review. It's time to reallocate. It's time to decide who the really valuable segments are and what we should be willing to, to pay to acquire them. So there's my recipe for customer-centric success. Does it apply to everybody? No. Again, not everyone should be customer-centric. But I would like to see all of you do what we I showed very briefly with Procter & Gamble earlier. Try it out. You take a, a, a part of your business, put it aside, and try to run it in a customer-centric way, just to get used to the metrics, to see what, what might work. 
Maybe you'll spread from there. Maybe you'll say the whole thing's ridiculous. But at least you have made an informed decision. Let me leave it at that. Uh, if there is time for any questions, I'd be real glad to talk about it. If any of you are interested in learning more about some of these methods and perspectives, there's uh, information for you. But do, do we have time for a couple of questions? Maybe a, a question or so? Okay, that's great. Well, thank you very much for your time and attention, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day.